welcome Acho to our 20th anniversary summit. It's wonderful that you could be with us uh, today as this, you know, you've been an advocate for access to medicines for what, decades now. You have known the Curative Commons community for a long while. It's such an honour and privilege for us to have you as our first keynote today. And so without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you and we will start the conversation and see where it goes in the next hour. So thanks for being with us, Atul. Fantastic, Catherine. Thank you very, very much. I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here because the 20th anniversary of Creative Commons is in part, I think, my own anniversary of being in the open movement in general. So anniversaries all around. Thank you. I, I'm Achal Prabhala. I've spent about the last 20 years almost working on access to medicines. Um, but I didn't actually plan to work on it this year or the last as, as, the la as 2019 drew to a close. I had grand plans for my life. I was going to stop working as an activist and transition to being a, a writer and a filmmaker, uh, which are things that I'd done in bits and pieces all these years, but I now wanted to make a full career of. And I planned to make this transition with a film on the history of access to medicines. I wanted to tell the story of the remarkable characters who inspired the work I did, uh, from black and brown folk in South Africa, who faced uh, HIV and AIDS in 1999, all the way up to middle-class families, white families in the United Kingdom, who couldn't afford to treat their young children for cystic fibrosis in 2019. But of course, as uh, with all best laid plans, mine went awry as well with the pandemic. I found that I couldn't not work on access to vaccines. I had to. And so my departure from activism was delayed and it continues to be. I'm, I'm glad that I could work on this problem despite the fact that it's been grueling, uh, not just because of the scale of the problem, but also because of the sudden attention to the kind of work that I do. And finally, also because it was tragically personal for me in ways that were simply overwhelming. I lived through a few months this year, uh, April, May and June, that were truly unbreakable and heartbreaking and months I hope no one ever has to live through anywhere ever again. And so uh, here I am. Uh, on a more cheerful note, I I first heard of Creative Commons when I was a student in the United States 19 years ago. This was 2002. A group of uh, students, colleagues of mine and I were trying to put together something we then called an equitable access license. We wanted a way in which universities, such as the one that I was studying at, could commercialize their patents on life-saving inventions without compromising access to them in poor countries. And we stumbled upon Creative Commons, which is at that time a young, fresh, uh, cool uh, outfit that was just starting up, based, I think, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They had a, an address there, and I thought that was very close to where I was. And they were both a really inspiring template uh, from another field of intellectual property, but also a really useful way to uh, license the actual text that we ourselves were trying to produce. I've been an admirer ever since. So congratulations to you, firstly, every one of you who makes Creative Commons on your 20th anniversary. I am so proud to be here to help you kick off this week of celebration and reflection. But I, I want to do this with a provocation, a provocation to seriously consider what lies on the margins of the open movement. In 2004, I worked on access to learning materials in South Africa. Most of my life has been spent working on against patent monopolies, but I, I briefly and intensely was involved in copyright alternatives and open access work and the one thing that struck me most out of those two years in South Africa, where I worked for a, a trade union, actually the country's largest trade union, uh, the South African Democratic Teachers Union, uh, trying to find ways to make learning a little easier for young children in public schools, uh, young 
uh, college students at public universities who sometimes had very little money for food and shelter, let alone textbooks, was how easily the access gap that, that was real and that I saw could have been solved with piracy. Yes, I know we are all to different degrees very uncomfortable with things that are clearly illegal, but piracy is the way I learned anything at all, and I don't feel uncomfortable about saying that. It's hard to explain exactly why I feel so warmly towards piracy. And I can point you to an article I, I co-authored in 2004 that addresses this with empirical evidence and some data. It was published in a, in a small uh, South African Journal of Information and Communications, and I guarantee that you've never read it. I guarantee that very few people have read it. It'll be posted on the chat. Um, the very keen among you um, can look at it. But let me give you the emotional pitch. I've spent the majority of my life in countries like India and South Africa and Brazil, where the books I wanted to read and nearly any film that I wanted to watch uh, was and remains either unaffordable or just simply inaccessible at any price. And you have to be here to understand this. Certainly today, 2021, things are much better than 2004. But it's also not that different. Back then, there were academic books which would have set me back by hundreds of dollars to buy. You know, money I simply did not have. And at the same time, I could walk into the nearest copy shop and point to a title on the wall and have it bound, uh, printed, covered a neat pirated copy in my hand instantly for a tiny fraction of the cost of the original. Had I lived in a rule-bound society like South Africa instead, with a far smaller and more timid informal economy, I can safely say that with my income and my parents' income, I simply could not have become the person I am today. I would have had a very different intellectual and professional journey and fundamentally, I would have been poorer as a result of it. So in 2004, I wrote about why Creative Commons should look at copyright pirates as allies, people who are working towards a shared goal, rather than as adversaries or something that was outside the fence. Now, to be fair, I don't know how much of the then expressed disdain for piracy was strategy, rather than something emanating from deep belief, but it still rankled regardless. And what this brings me to is a question of means and ends. I'm not a by any means necessary person, by any means, and never will be. But that doesn't stop me from evaluating means and ends and seeing things like piracy, not only for what they are, but what they accomplish. This particular problem, uh, an insistence on fairness, on legality, uh, on playing by the rules and a strict adherence to working within the law uh, struck me again in the heated fight for vaccine access in the pandemic. There's a lot to say about vaccine access, but the, the short way to describe the world we live in today is that we are in a state of vaccine apartheid. While many of you probably come from countries like the United States, uh, or countries in Europe where between 50 and 70% of all adults have been vaccinated. Uh, less than 13% of the Indian population has been vaccinated. Less than 3% of the African continent has been vaccinated. And that situation, which has been building even before the vaccines have discovered, has somehow only gotten more desperate and worse since vaccines were actually discovered. We now therefore live in apartheid because this is a completely artificial pandemic at this point, we could all have economies and societies that are functioning at the level of America or Europe if we had the same vaccination rates, but we don't because of corporate monopolies that restrict how many vaccines are out there doing their work in the world. I've been, as part of my work, uh, part of a range of coalitions that seek to do for vaccines what Creative Commons did for copyright, which is essentially to liberate them legally. And they've all failed, every one of them. And these are things I worked on, so I'm describing my work. It's my fault. I still continue to work on multiple legal means to achieve 
what we want, which is keeping my loved ones safe and all of humanity alive at this point. But my history with legality, let's just say, means I have a completely different take on the kinds of lurid headlines that I've been witness to in the last year and a half, like this. U.S. accuses hackers of trying to steal corona vaccine, coronavirus vaccine data for China. U.S. charges Chinese COVID-19 cyber spies. U.S. says Chinese Iranian hackers seek to steal coronavirus research. Exclusive. Iran-linked hackers recently targeted coronavirus drug maker Gilead. China and Iran hackers fingered for targeting COVID-19 vaccine research and development. U.S. warns that China, Iran have launched cyber attacks on firms developing vaccines. Hackers try to steal COVID vaccine secrets and intellectual property war. These are not, by the way, from fringe publications. These are headlines from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the BBC, every other respectable publication. I don't know about you, but these headlines made me incredibly sad. What does hacking vaccine technology even mean? It's like accusing a hungry person who steals bread of being a criminal for trying to stay alive. I know that there's layer upon layer of geopolitics and industrial espionage involved here that adds all kinds of complexities. But when I saw these headlines, I thought, look, why aren't American scientists working together with Chinese scientists and Iranian scientists, and in fact, every other kind of scientist from every other part of the world? It made no sense that they'd be competing, but here we are in the middle of the greatest human threat this planet has faced in a hundred years. And we've effectively outsourced our survival to a handful of competing commercial firms that not only do not work together, but are now gloating over the civil disobedience of other people who are shut out, whose motivations for wanting to get in are mainly to stay alive. Coming from where I do, it's impossible not to think that we sometimes overestimate the power of legally sanctioned sharing and that we severely discount the value of civil disobedience. And I think you, the Creative Commons community, would do well to think about how other movements, renegade movements, are also trying to achieve the same things you are. Sure, they get much less respect than you do, but also sometimes they get better results. Historically, the way the open movement has assimilated good new ideas coming from the world has been through a fortuitous combination of accident and necessity. Uh, for several years, I was on the wrong side of this equation. I had what I and several others thought was a fairly good idea. Uh, a little background here. I spent over 10 years on the advisory board of the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, an association that I was very, very proud of. Wikipedia, of course, is the shining jewel in our open movement and is arguably the most successful project in the history of the world to ever use a Creative Commons license. After spending several years trying to build a movement to edit Wikipedia in some of the more far-flung parts of the world uh, that I lived and worked in, in India, in South Africa, and in Brazil, I, I turned my energy inwards. I wanted to do something more challenging, more intellectual, I had an advisory role, but I was obsessed with Wikipedia, as I think every sane person should be. And I turned my uh, energy to help it to grow and remake itself. I didn't feel it was merely an honor, but I really did feel it was my duty to. And I directed my energy towards what Wikipedia wasn't doing well, in my opinion, which was redefining knowledge. To get a few things clear, yeah, Wikipedia relies on published, textual citations, and it insists on a high standard of reliability for these citations, which is all perfectly sensible. What it means, however, is that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia in a new form rather than a new kind of encyclopedia. So people get confused between the two. It's a new way of doing an old thing rather than a new thing. And the reason that it's a new way of doing an old thing is that as long as you insist the knowledge is only something that has been written down in multiple reliable sources, you're also effectively saying that societies that don't publish large quantities of texts and haven't over the last several hundred years are in fact dumb. 
devoid of knowledge. Coming from one such society, India, and then living and working in another, South Africa, I knew that this last statement just isn't true. We're not dumb. <laughs> I shouldn't have to say it, but I, I feel I must. There are multiple ways in which knowledge is produced in every society, and one of those ways that Wikipedia did not and does not acknowledge is through people. So I ran a large transcontinental project to illustrate another way of citing sources by recording them. Because these sources were people, we call them oral citations, and we arranged them in the manner of a traditional textual citation. So if you saw the actual Wikipedia article that emerged, it didn't look very different. We had multiple sources, uh, indications of the reliability of the source, and even contradictions and disagreements as to what the thing was, as one would have to reconcile uh, with when citing multiple text sources in a regular Wikipedia article. It created a bit of a stir. Uh, almost entirely outside the Wikimedia movement uh, and was met within uh, by an uncomfortable silence at first. Um, there was a long and I think complimentary article about it in the New York Times and the research and the process of film that came out of it and the outputs that came out of it are all up on uh, wikimedia.org. But when finally people started to notice it, it was met with derision. Uh, now, just to be clear, I ran a project that aimed to make Wikipedia articles out of, let's say, a popular drink in South Africa made with fruit or uh, food that was made in India and eaten for breakfast, but something that millions of people knew and loved, but just not extensively written up in books, in recipe books, to the extent that it could receive the kind of attention on Wikipedia that it deserved. Uh, in response, a renowned Wikipedian and Dutch historian suggested that if Wikipedia considered my appeal, that the next step would be rewriting historical events in the Middle Ages and then turning the world upside down. This was in 2011. Uh, so just to be clear, I was trying to say that things that I eat for breakfast, like idlis or dosas or things like that, that tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people consume every day here, or a drink made from the Morula fruit in South Africa, which millions of people consume there, uh, deserves some attention even though they weren't in recipe books, and the argument against that was, well, what about the Middle Ages? This was in 2011, and I uh, suffered that humiliation for years. <laughs> Actually, was somewhat joyfully suffered it because the objections were so absurd that they were downright funny. But because it happened in 2011, in another era, uh, no one was thinking seriously about some of the kinds of things people are now. And by that, I mean words like diversity and inclusion and all these other pretty words that I can only repeat ironically, they were not yet uh, quite so uh, ubiquitous as they are today. So we were not fortuitous. There was no accident of good luck. And this kind of deep, meaningful expansion of Wikipedia, this idea of what the world's most significant open project and knowledge resource could make itself into were also never considered necessary. It fell by the wayside of good intentions. It's revived every once in a way in the spirit of the times we now live in, but clearly as sort of a window dressing. There's no real desire uh, on the part of anyone, I think, to try to transform Wikipedia into what I think it could be. Um, and I eventually quit the Wikimedia Foundation's advisory board because there was simply no appetite to do anything remotely challenging with a business model that seemed to work perfectly well, even with all its inadequacies. Uh, in the mid 20th century, there's this apocryphal story, which is really not clear if it's true. And so I'll repeat it uh, with that caveat. Somebody took FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt uh, the legendary uh, president uh, who presided over the reconstruction of America, a really good plan. Uh, I think it was a labor plan. FDR said, that is a wonderful idea. You've convinced me. Now make me do it. This example, this apocryphal, this apocryphal conversation is often cited approvingly uh, as a way by which politics works. Not only must you have a good idea that is justified with data and evidence, but you must also mobilize mass social and political will in order to get it done. I don't see it as a particularly good thing. I don't think that politicians or leaders of the open movement uh, must simply take a list of the 10 most popular things people want and then implement them. 
And if that is all that they had to do, then we could replace them with 15 lines of code that I could write in five minutes. I think that there is, uh, uh, that it's somewhat unfair to place the burden not only of uh, figuring out what's right, but also uh, the absolutely uh, optimal and necessary way of making sure that what's right gets done uh, on the set of people who want to do the right thing. It, you know, you are not passive leaders, you have choices. You can identify the right things to do and then you can help make them happen by making them necessary. You have power. One of the broader problems, I think, with the way that institutions who promote openness function is that they are still stuck in the era and in the manner that they were defined. Creative Commons, for instance, uh, and I'm just summarizing massively, so forgive the generalizations, was set up largely against the kind of Walt Disney-driven version of copyright with all its lobbying and legislative successes in America. And very similarly in the vaccine world, the way open access to vaccines is designed, the way my counterparts work on access to medicines is with a model that counters a company like Moderna in the United States, right? A company which has received over $1 billion in taxpayer funds to make its vaccine and was then guaranteed multi-billion dollar profits. I mean, literally profits in the multi-billions of dollars uh, as an incentive through pre-orders of their vaccines from rich countries. But that model falls apart when it comes to dealing with countries like Cuba. Uh, a month ago, I was privileged to chair a conversation with the health minister of Cuba, along with health ministers from Argentina and Mexico, uh, foreign ministers from Bolivia and Venezuela, as part of the work of a group called Progressive International, which brings together progressive governments from around the world and has a large footprint in Latin America. And one of the most heartbreaking things I heard from the Cuban health minister was that the way that they could conduct research on these vaccines uh, in a medical system that they are justifiably proud of, which is a sort of jewel in the world, was by assuring their leadership that no money would be diverted from the food budget to go into vaccine research. Because of course, Cuba was on the losing end of new sanctions initiated by the then US President Donald Trump when he was in power, which the current US President Joe Biden has chosen not to lift. But the funny thing was that despite all the odds, Cuba persisted and succeeded. They now have two vaccines, uh, Abdallah and Soberana Dos, which both show high efficacy. They are vaccines that are made with something called a protein subunit. There's a long, complicated story I can tell you, but I'll spare you from. The, the upshot is that protein subunit vaccines are one of the two holy grails of vaccine development, mRNA vaccines, of course, being the most vaunted among these technologies. Protein subunit vaccines are just very easy to make. They're a known technology, but they're also a very easily manufacturable technology. And the world doesn't yet have a viable protein subunit vaccine for COVID. Cuba has two. They were willing to license these vaccines openly to absolutely any country or entity that wanted to make them. However, what they wanted to do was to charge what they would call a solidarity price, a, a reasonable price that they could then apply to the strained finances of a country that's been unjustly targeted for sanctions for decades, that's been at the receiving end of a lot of political turbulence, which I, when I heard it, thought was absolutely fine. It sounded fair. They would have to invest uh, resources in sending people over to train other factories and countries on how to make these vaccines. And it seemed only fair that they get paid something in return that was reasonable. And in fact, they were willing to solve the problem of a huge, huge catastrophic undersupply of vaccines. But Many of my colleagues in the open access movement and in Geneva, at the World Health Organization and at other places didn't understand this. I had worked with colleagues on, uh, on something called the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, CETA, which was meant to be a kind of Wikimedia Commons of vaccine technology from which uh, vaccine technology that worked could then be licensed very easily to anyone who wanted to make it. 
The problem was that the Cubans didn't want to be in CETA. And the problem with CTAP in part was that it was set up with parameters mainly defined against a company like Moderna, where if you've received all these vast public subsidies, then you, it's your turn to now do something back for the world. But the particularities of what Cuba wanted somehow fell within the cracks and weren't really understood by anybody and that confounded me. I think that there is a a disjuncture when we think of creative creators and users, which itself is a limited definition of the two kinds of groups that we concern ourselves with when thinking within the open movement. We've often thought of these groups as distinct, and now we know, of course, that they're almost entirely overlapping, that they are two deeply intertwined categories which couldn't exist without the other. But just like with Cuba, I'm not sure the open movement fully understands what it has to do and how it can help the small creator, the kind of creator who very much wants to share their wealth with the world, but also live and eat. There are two things I read over the last few years which helped reshape my understanding of the role I myself played in the open movement. Uh, one of them is a lovely book by a person who I admire very much called Astra Taylor. It's called The People's Platform. I think it was a little ahead of its time, um, and a more recent Yale Law Journal article by Amy Kuczynski, who teaches law at Yale Law School. Her article is called The Law of Information, Informational Capitalism. What a close reading of these texts and an evolution of my own understanding of my role in this movement has led me to is a feeling of being slightly ashamed I don't think that I or anyone else in this movement, uh, when I worked within it full time uh, earlier in the 21st century, ever did it in order to build Silicon Valley's oligarchy. Now, no one said, let's promote Creative Commons licenses because Sergey Brin needs you know, a third plane. But effectively, I think that's what we did. And I do think that the open movement, for better or worse, served as the bedrock of this highly profitable, highly exploitative Silicon Valley sharing economy. And I think it's something we have to grapple with and reckon with. Because if we don't, we, I don't think we fully understand how we can prevent doing so again and how we can move forward without a full account of what it means to have been in the open movement for the last 20 years, like I've been. To conclude, I've offered you wildly disparate examples here, and I apologize for them, but I do hope that what these examples suggest is a flavor of what lies on the margins of Creative Commons and the open movement, in the hope that these examples offer us ways to make ourselves anew. Uh, Creative Commons was born in a kind of brilliance in reaction to the world as it existed then. Now you turn 20. And my hope is that you are reborn in another kind of brilliance, which reacts to the world that we live in today with all its entirety, with its changes and its challenges. Uh, thank you for tolerating me. And I, I look forward very much to the discussion. Thank you so much, Achal. And, and I, I, we're not just talking to you. We're, we're, we're so pleased that you are here with us and, and provoking uh, us as well. And I think that's so important because you mentioned the question about being challenged. And I think that that's something that um, as we reflect in the past 20 years and think about our achievements and we think about the next, uh, yeah, Derek's put in much more than tolerating, thank you. Uh, and we think about the next 20 years, the ideas around what we've been talking about earlier about better sharing about a better internet and what that looks like is really important and you might have seen some of the writing of, of, of our current board member Alec Tchaikovsky and, and Paul who have written about the open paradox which is really challenging that very thing of, that you're describing but maybe uh, before um and uh, you're getting some great uh, feedback in the chat from Ross and others so this is great Maybe um, I can ask the first question and please um, please put your questions into the chat and I will pose them to Ashtel. But maybe the first question I can ask is, what do you, how do you see Creative Commons in the next 20 years? Uh, and what, if you could think about in 20, what were we, 2041, Ashtel, 
what would you like to see? What would be the ideal outcome that you would like to see in terms of access to medicines? Uh, Catherine, now you're putting me on the spot because look, <laughs> I was playing a, a restaurant critic. I didn't say I could make it. <laughs> no, uh, no I, I, I'm joking. But look, uh, I do feel very much a part of this movement. And I, so I think that, and I do hope that what I've said doesn't come across as being needlessly critical or, or, or trivially critical because it is very much a reflection from the inside, of the yeah. inside. Yeah. I, I, I'm struck by, I think, uh, a kind of daily disjuncture I felt in my life when I just got to know about Creative Commons. This was the period between 2002 and 2005, yeah. which was both how much this made sense to me, yes, intellectually, how much I supported it, and how little it mattered to the places I lived in, which were India and South Africa at that time, yes? What I would love to see in the next 20 years is for that disjuncture to cease to exist. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Ashok. Now, there's one question that is down. We see, so what stopped the movements from going in a different direction? Why, why, why have we got stuck? <laughs> Catherine, I, I feel like some of these questions you should be taking the first. I know, <laughs> I know. And it, well, I think that part of it is, 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 you know, we're here in the next five days to think about some of these things as well. But I think also there's something about the way that the internet has developed, I think the way platform power has developed, I think that you know some of those um, aspects really from around what 2011 to today were were things that people kind of talked about in the Creative Commons movement as the kind of you know the the the, the, the darker places that things could go to, um, and and we've seen some of that happening, and now we have to take stock and take action to prevent things from happening and if you know, we, we can determine our future if we choose to do that and you've been challenging to us that we need to to think about that um can, I'm I, just gonna... say, can I just add to that in a first yes. second um you know in terms of i think that some of this goes back to the kind of original missions uh yes. movements like creative Commons and wikipedia started out with and i think perhaps there's also a problem of having been too successful Maybe. at that original mission and, and i explain what i mean i do think that the success of Creative Commons as a mainstream legal alternative copyright movement in the United States or the United Kingdom or Europe, that cannot be dismissed. It is real, it is big, right? I think that the success, however, in these highly regimented um, countries where the rule of law is followed mm -hmm. has meant that that is the direction that shows the most promise. Mm -hmm. With Wikipedia, uh, I see that Florence my dear friend Florence uh, is here. And uh, I remember being with Florence in a meeting in Taiwan, in Taipei, uh, the first ever meeting of the uh, advisory board, which Florence was chairing with Eric Muller. There were a range of other people there where it was first disclosed that uh, I think it was either Nature or the New Scientist had run a uh, ranking of the accuracy of articles across Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia. And they found that on average, the accuracy of Wikipedia articles was higher. Mm. Uh, this was quite a watershed moment. Uh, and I think that for many people who had to suffer the humiliation of being part of such a lovely, exciting project like Wikipedia, that people hurled scorn at. You had to be, I think, alive and in that mix between, let's say, 2001 and 2006, yeah. Um, to understand that uh, scorn and, and react against it. The relief at being respectable, the relief at being a thing that was accepted in the world was so immense mm. that it meant, I think, for many people that they never wanted to be in a phase of experimentation where they would be subjected to the same kind of ridicule again, mm. is my take. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a really interesting insight about these moments that can turn things as well. Um, Paul's put something in the chat. I don't know if you see that actually saying, what do you think CC should do to make its presence more felt in the world? It seems the open movement is progressing. There are also forces trying to drive it in directions that might be more for personal interest and, and, grand, and, and grandizement. Um, well, I, I, maybe I should answer the question about what do I think CC should do to make its presence more felt in the world is that, um, we want, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a small 
team, but we've got a big footprint and we want to have a bigger footprint. And that means, and I don't mean that in terms of you know anything to do with sustainability. What I mean about that is about trying to make sure that more people know about Creative Commons, that more people understand that we can you know, affect more change for everyone everywhere, having that knowledge, access to knowledge and culture, which is just absolutely critical to having a quality of life. Um, and I think that, uh, and there's Melissa actually saying about, it's inspiring you to talk about the fond memories of that, but that, that it's, it's, it's true, these moments are really important. Um, I mean, thinking about moments, actually, when, when, when was the kind of moment for you when you kind of really, you know, saw like the future in terms of the, the challenges that you've been seeing with, you know, the, the vaccine situation and how are you, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, how hard it was for you back in April, May and how your journey to try and do something out of activism was changed back to kind of being focused. I mean, how, how have you handled that situation and what advice could you give to others who may be in the same situation in this chat but can't talk to you just now? I have to say, uh, Catherine, it's been really confusing because on one level, I've never received so much attention in my life. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I do a lot of media yeah. and I, I write myself in a number of publications, which I used to do before as well, but I am now almost forced to do so. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, it's a different um, kind of elevation that's happened during the pandemic. And it's not because I'm special, but it's rather just because suddenly I think people now understand the importance of what I do and what many, many others who, by the way, work on the same things I do, uh, uh, my parents live five minutes away from where I live in Bangalore, across the lake. Uh, they love me. I love them. <laughs> they haven't actually ever understood what I do until the <laughs> pandemic. And they were motivated by the same kind of self-interest, I think, that's driving all these other people now to understand what vaccine monopolies are, yes. to understand why even legally sanctioned monopolies in the form of patents are, can be very, very bad yeah. uh, and very bad for our lives. Look. Uh, one of the hard things to do, therefore, has been to balance both the incredible attention that this kind of work is getting. So the problem is getting a lot of attention, but that hasn't hastened any kind of solution. So yeah. it's a very confusing time because never have I been more busy, never have I been doing more work, and never have I also achieved less. It's just a fact. I have not technically achieved anything, actually, so far. And I mean this, except for generating a degree of useful noise, putting new arguments out into the world. But I think you have to be prepared for a very long runway for mm -hmm. some of these things to, yeah. uh, to seed and to grow. And what I think the problem within the pandemic is that, especially during the months of April and May here in India and June, um, you know, it was unbelievable, Catherine. I mean, there were days, uh, you know, if people, there were days on which a good day was on which the my WhatsApp messages were only about people wanting help to get a person into hospital or get oxygen. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the bad days, which were, you know, 90% of those days were this person's dead, that person's dead. Uh, there were people who would leave me messages or try to call me. And if they didn't pick up when I called back, I'd go into a panic because I was wondering who's dead. Um, I had to try to shield my parents from some of this because they're at an age, they're in their 80s. There are lots and lots of people that they knew. I don't know how they survived it, actually. It was, but and yet we survived, so we're the lucky ones. But there was something very difficult during that period of time because it affected me so personally yeah. to take yeah. this long view of things. It mm -hmm. wasn't actually very comforting to know that all of this work and this this movement that is happening around people being becoming aware of what the problem is might lead to a solution a year from now or two years from now. It actually wasn't of much comfort to me because yeah. it felt like we were living through hell. And so yes. it really didn't seem to make sense. But I do think it's still important to take the long view because that's the only long term in which anything actually happens and changes um, and to continue fighting uh, for what's just and right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there's some really good comment coming through. I, th I think Yulia said, you know, if your parents understand your work now, so do hundreds of thousands of other people. And I think that's a challenge for each one of us in this chat is that explaining what we're actually doing to our parents, our family, and to spread a message to a, a wider, broader audience um, is really important. And I think please, please know that we really value what, what work you've done. And perhaps in years to come, you'll reflect on this time 
and the impact you've actually had you might not see at that moment but actually it's you know when we think about the copyright battles that are ongoing and the work that still needed to be done you know it is about how we work more closely together the impact that we can have together and 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 to have the solidarity we can have together as well but you are right that it's a long game and i hate you that word game it's not a game it's a, it's a it's a long journey to get to where we want to see because what you're doing is right but the 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 the, the, the things around us are challenging us um and uh, you know, and and uh, we've got to face those challenges head on. I'm just looking. There's another couple of comments coming in. I see um, that somebody's talked about personal self-interest and aggrandizement, causal factors themselves, or are they simply a result of the way that non-profit funding works? And that's another thing. I mean, you, how do we fund some of this great work that we need when you've got so much interest and so much financing on the other side? You know, how how can we support making sure that uh, medicines and vaccines are accessible to the world particularly a time where it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated the north if the south are not vaccinated as well what are we doing you know the challenges we face just now are huge um look i think that there are a couple of uh ways i can suggest i think that one very safe way which is something that i'm sure is already has been thought of in the movement and is being done is to make sure that as much work downstream is licensed through creative commons so that even if it gets uh into more sort of a proprietary domain as it goes upstream, you still have as much as you can in the public domain until it gets to a point where it's completely proprietary, right? Mm -hmm. So meaning like this is a bit of a tree and the way that it works is that it moves up a scale. And so if you can capture as much of that scale as early as possible, then at least you have a fighting chance of yeah. uh, an entry point, right? But I do think that there are a couple of other things that are happening here, which are harder to translate into what Creative Commons can do. Yeah. Um, let me tell you what they are, because I found them fascinating. And I think just also immediately sense making uh, a group of um, Stanford University medical researchers uh, found disused whole vials of Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, which they then deconstructed and which they then performed every kind of analysis they could on and released that information on GitHub, actually. So they turned, uh, they did the very best that they could with uh, the actual physical substance of the vaccine. So that doesn't actually tell you how it was made, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of secrets still remain, but um, there were ways in which that they could put into the public domain as much as they could extract from the actual physical material of the two mRNA vaccines that work in this world. More recently, colleagues of mine working uh, for a nonprofit in the United States called Public Citizen uh, gained access to a part, but not the whole, of uh, a vaccine contract, a licensing contract from Pfizer to uh, uh, one part of its infrastructure that it had outsourced vaccine production to, and then they released it into the public domain. And so then that gives you something like you know, 20 or 30 of what are called these quality steps in the manufacturing process of the Pfizer vaccine. So a lot of the juju, right, around this juju, I, I don't know if that word makes sense there, but the kind of magic around uh, the vaccine technology that is proprietary, it's not even protected by patents, by the way. So this is the yeah. funniest kind of intellectual property because it's literally papers that you put in a safe, right? And so it is treated as that. This is like the Coke secret formula or something. Um, but uh, they, will, they would call it trade secrets, and that's how they would seek legal protection around it. But they also actually enforce physical secrecy in order that it doesn't leak. Uh, but this is really just a series of steps. You know, step one, turn left, turn right, go straight for five meters, etc. right? Look under that plant. Um, and they released a part of those steps. And I think that's also a really good step in the right direction. And I think that if more people who worked at these companies undermined the legally protected but completely unjust layers of monopolies and secrecy that these states and their constitutions essentially are uh, mistakenly empowered to protect. If more people undermine that at risk of uh, personal loss, uh, including criminal charges and, and court proceedings, I think that that would be a very good way. And I think that civil disobedience is something we just don't consider enough. I don't know how that integrates with Creative Commons, but uh, I do think that it's a valuable tool at our disposal. 
think um, I think um, put, put something in the, something in, the, in, the in the chat, which is part of CC success, especially with governments and institutions, happens because CC's licences and programmes operate in legal spaces, as you like rightly said, Achill. Is it possible for CC to simultaneously work in and promote legal open licensing and partner with movements based on non um, legal piracy? How do we walk that line? He's asked. I think that there are a number of ways in which this can happen. Um, I think in part, they also depend upon using the Creative Commons model as a way to uh, financially empower uh, smaller vaccine manufacturers. Uh, and I don't know how well this fits within the current suite of CC licenses or its mission or you know the, the kinds of options that you have on offer, but it's certainly something that groups like Creative Commons could help with. Because countries like Cuba, the problem that they have is not only they have these two amazing vaccines, which don't quite fit into the kind of formal definition of the open access world, but also are from Cuba. And so, you know, it's not like they have slick people in suits that are marketing these vaccines elsewhere. So it's actually quite, even though these vaccines are available for anyone to manufacture, it will take some trouble for you know another manufacturer in another country to get in touch with them and set it up and make it happen. And so there's a huge role that intermediaries can play both in the legal process of setting up the kinds of arrangements that are necessary, as well as uh, for intermediaries who can give publicity and validation to what it is that they are licensing. Um, this is a complex thing for something like Creative Commons to step into, but it's the role that Creative Commons could have a part in as a set of uh, valuable intermediaries that could help truly proliferate a technology that wants to proliferate in the world. Thanks, Acho. Now, I'm looking at more questions in the chat. Someone has put a scary thought that there's people who think they're engaging in civil disobedience are called anti-vaxxers, like my step family, someone's put in. Um, let's see where else there are. We've already had the personal interest. Um, I'm just not seeing any more. Maybe I'm just looking. We've got captioning and interpretation, Achil, as well, which is really helpful, too, so that um, more people can access the discussion and, and take part. Um, Maybe you know some reflection on your part when you've seen some of the the, the conversation just now. Has it surprised you? Has it kind of, has it, it, it encouraged you? Um, or do you think there's some things that we really need to take away from this discussion? It's encouraged me immensely. By the way, to you know, the perfect truth is that I was you know mildly scared of uh, coming in front of the open movement, the Creative Commons community, the Wikipedia community. Some of my best friends in the world are from that world, uh, but I haven't really engaged in a while now. And in part, it's because of some of the differences that I outlined. I am so happy that we now are at a different age when uh, I think we're all just more welcoming of challenging ideas. Uh, and I'm probably less abrasive than I was 10 years ago. <laughs> as well. I'm not as annoying. But I, I do think that um, there, there was a, a, a small discussion which I thought was useful, which is that you know there are limits to what Creative Commons licenses can do as well, um, which is that the, and this is a limit, by the way, that extends to some of the civil disobedience I described, as well as the piracy, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very, very regulated industry, you know, and so, um, what Creative Commons can do in the vaccine access movement um, is not that much greater in terms of power than what piracy can do as well. So even if we were to get large numbers of people within Pfizer and BioNTech to release uh, every little bit of information they have on their vaccines, even if uh, we could get some of this uh, research put under Creative Commons licenses, there is a way by which unless Pfizer or BioNTech formally authorizes a company in India to make its vaccine, even if that company makes the exact same vaccine, it isn't considered to be the same vaccine, which is this incredibly boring wrinkle of the way vaccines are regulated by drug regulators rather than the patent regulators, yeah. which is unfortunately, as things stand, uh, an indication that vaccine manufacturers have a permanent monopoly on this vaccine because it's not just patents, they actually have a monopoly on uh, the regulation system that very few people know about, which is very hard to overcome. 
unless we have at this moment, unless we have both a combination of popular will and a political recognition of it, because it's really, this is working in FDR's New Deal, which is that I've no doubt, and I've in fact heard this personally, that there are any number of people in the Biden White House, even people in the German government who sincerely want the same things I want, which is a dismantling of the monopoly structure that is withholding adequate vaccine supplies to the world, right? But when the Biden administration, for instance, supported the South African Indian uh, waiver of pharmaceutical monopolies at the World Trade Organization, the TRIPS waiver, which some of you might have heard about, a request that was launched in October of last year and was finally acknowledged by only the Biden administration, no other rich country government in May of this year, it was a decision that Biden made on the basis that there were huge, huge calls from people, voters from across the United States. And I, I used to speak to them late into the night, you know, from Seattle to, to Boston to God knows where else, uh, about the importance of the TRIPS waiver. And those groups of people, I think, really made that happen and changed the Biden administration's mind. So you need that popular will, you need the political will, but without that, actually, there isn't a clear legal solution to greater vaccine access at the moment. And I think that's what's really scary. It really does depend on the goodwill of ordinary people who understand this problem. You know, whether or not you face it, to, to understand that there are people who have this problem in vast parts of the world, who can then translate that, not in the countries in which I live in and work in, but in the countries that you live in and work in, which is Europe and the United States, to translate that into marshalling a kind of political will uh, in those countries. Because without that, we're stuck in this for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Archo. I see that Julia is putting people in the German government who want to dismantle farm monopolies. Tell me more. But I think no, I just think, oh, Julia, yeah, no, I no, I actually don't. What I mean is, you know, there are some good people there who, uh, uh, who, who can see some of the things that we're saying. But I think Julia is right. There's, probably less people in the German administration maybe than in the Biden White House at the moment who want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm looking for more questions. So we've got kind of, oh, we've we're, we're come, we've got eight minutes left. So um, people want to ask their last questions. Um, while, while I'm waiting for some people to ask some last questions, I'll just ask Ashley about his Shuttleworth Fellowship. Tell us about what you're doing with Shuttleworth and what you're finding being a Shuttleworth Fellow. So, you know, the, the wonderful thing uh, about still being a Shuttleworth Fellow is that I'm actually strictly not one. I started in 2016 and I ended in 2019, but I love everyone at Shuttleworth. Um, and uh, because I started making a film in 2019, until very recently, I was using money that I'd been given on my fellowship as part of the three years that I was there. Uh, Julia is, in fact, a Shuttleworth Fellow at this moment. Uh, Cecilia Oliveira, who you will hear from tomorrow, uh, is, in fact, a legitimate Shuttleworth Fellow. I'm, at the moment, just a pretender. Uh, <laughs> I like him, and, you know, I'm having trouble separating. Um, but it was a, a kind of a life-changing thing. I uh, have... Uh, I've never been opposed to both earning more money myself as well as having more money to do the work that I want. It's just that I think I was so stubborn and somewhat bloody minded about knowing what I wanted to do very clearly uh, that I had to find ways to do that. And usually in my life, that meant doing it uh, for free or for very little money because that was the only way that I could get to do what I felt was consequential and what I, I felt was really necessary to do. So when uh, Shuttleworth came along in 2016, um, it was the first time I think uh, somebody had, had said with, with so much power and confidence that I think that what you're doing is good. And you know, here's a little something to help you go on that journey. It meant uh, an immense amount to me and it still does. I truly actually think that it's the best possible thing that can happen to you for anyone in this movement, um, anyone with vaguely similar aspirations. So I'd urge you to apply and try because they're a nice bunch even, you know, yeah. which is which yeah. most of them actually, I won't tell you who, but no, yeah. they're all a nice bunch. They're, I'm just, this is just a meaningless <laughs> joke. Uh, but they, they, they're a lovely bunch. Uh, you should get to know them. Uh, if you're interested, you should definitely apply. Uh, it's one of the best things that can happen to your life. 
I can assure you that it was one of the best things that happened to mine. Oh, that's great to know. Now, there's two quick last questions that are kind of interrelated, sure. but we'll get them in. Uh, Virginia says, how do you build popular political will? And then Derek's come in with, what's your best case scenario for civil society efforts over the next year, five years, 10 years? So kind of building politi popular political will and best case scenario for civil society. Uh, I'll answer this question right about, right? One is I think that the onus of building a popular movement or momentum, I don't think should rest on the few people that it, it seems to at the moment. Meaning that I don't think that people who come up with good solutions and ideas and, and work hard to implement them also should be in charge of making sure that, you know, 50 million people agree with them, right? Uh, so I do believe that there has to be some space in leadership or policy making in politics for the best ideas to come through and, and be implemented. If not, again, you know, what is the point of leadership, right, in, in some way, if it's merely reacting to the most popular things? Because once something is very popular, then it's very easy to get it done, actually. You know, that's, then you're sort of doing the work of politics. And I, I don't believe that all of that onus should be on us. At the same time, though, I have seen how it's worked, and it unfortunately remains one of the only uh, tools of mobilization we have. But that's because good advice and the right advice and empirical data-driven policy framework suggestions are disregarded unless they also come inbuilt with a mass movement of 50 million people, right? And I think that's ridiculous. But for me, in the vaccine access movement, in the open access movement, I think that one of the most significant ways in which this changes is that uh, middle class white people in Europe and America, people such as many of those of you who are here today, have experience some of the same kinds of things that other people have. When I started working on access to medicines 20 years ago, it was inconceivable that this was a problem that affected people who are not black and brown. By 2015 and 16, there were cracks in the ceiling. They always were. They just became evident by 2015. And now it's just split wide open. You know, Europe had vaccine supplies delayed. Uh, middle class families in the United Kingdom couldn't give their children a life extending cystic fibrosis drug, a case that I was privileged to work on with colleagues in the UK who were working on it. Uh, the price of cancer medicines, the price of insulin, the price of any number of other life saving therapies across the rich world is are too expensive, both for middle class people as well as some of the richest governments on earth. And I think when we all experience the same kinds of problems with different degrees of intensity and effect, we can then see ourselves as working towards a, a, a common goal. The only people who profited out of this pandemic, it's not the societies of the United States or the United Kingdom, which are still reeling from the Delta variant, which came from India at a time when we had 3% of our population vaccinated. It is Pfizer and Moderna who are posting revenues of between 25 and $35 billion a year this year for that one single COVID vaccine product, right? And so if we all realize that we are as much victims of this system as each other to different degrees, but equally victims, we have a common shared incentive to change the system. And so for me, I truly, truly believe that it is a universal global feeling that will shift momentum on things like pharmaceutical monopolies, uh, not the question of having to do charity to countries like mine. Well, you've ended this, I've got, I think, a, a couple of minutes left and, and, and the chat is, you know, there's there's just a few bits and pieces. Um, Pranesh has said, I feel the limitation of over, overly legalistic approach to openness has been shown by how the vaccine production discussions have gone, you know, how Tech Transmis put a, a link there. Paul's put something about a COVID vaccine from South Africa to Europe dismantled, and uh, it's listening to the unpopular and dissimilar to find common ground, addressing systematic inequalities, mobilizing broad, diverse support, making real change, and so much more underneath that. I think you've really challenged us tonight, Achal, but also please keep doing what you are doing by raising the issues of access to medicine. And uh, and your shout out to anyone on this call who is interested in joining the, the wonderful Shuttleworth group of uh, fellows is, is very much loud and heard. But I would like us all on behalf of the whole group of people who are listening um, this evening to thank you for your insights. Thank you for your time. 
and thank you for being part of this movement and for coming tonight to be our first keynote in this the 20th anniversary global summit which we are celebrating as well as reflecting on so big shout out i wish everybody could clap and we could hear everybody but we'll have to just pretend actually that we're listening to that and uh... in lieu of that, in lieu of that uh, so many old friends in the chat by the way you know florence and melissa and pranesh and uh, just so many people and julia uh, it's been a pleasure catherine i oh. incredibly appreciated this it feels a bit full circle-ish for me as well uh, i'm delighted at the way you are i am excited at what happens next uh, and i'm here with you and Enjoy the day. Thank you, Ashel.